All righty, folks. I don't think it is a secret that I believe there will be many accidental landlords coming over the next one to five years. What is an accidental landlord? We will define that in a minute. But before we do, let's bring on the CEO of Hemlane. How are you doing, Dana? I'm great. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. I got to tell you, I think Hemlane is going to be a core anchor for the accidental landlord because you make it easy. You focus on the landlord. But I actually want to step back, define what I mean by accidental landlord, get your feedback, and then more importantly, talk about what Hemlane could do for that non-purpose built landlord. You ready for this? I'm ready. So for me, an accidental landlord is somebody who buys their own occupied home. Their grand vision is to live there for several years. And usually what happens is they become a move up buyer, which means they sell their first entry level home and then they buy the next one. Most of the time they take the equity from said property and they use some, if not all of it in the next property, thus keeping the payment roughly the same. That has worked for decades. I would argue it worked since the early 80s. This 40-year track record, the move-up buyer has been a huge component of that of the real estate market. They are now on hold. And I believe they will be on hold for years to come. And what will happen now is when they want to move up, because there's no doubt they will want to move up, they want to job change, they want to do something, they will instead of sell and move the equity to other property, they will simply save three and a half percent down or five percent down. And they will just go in with a new uh, low down payment and keep, this is the important, this is the accidental landlord yeah. part. They will now keep that other property because frankly, it will be a cash flow monster yeah. and it will help them afford the new property. So that's what I think an accidental landlord is. What do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I also, so the definition um, is more eloquently said than I could even say. Um, but the second part is I do think with interest rates, you suddenly look at it and say, why would I sell this property when I've been locked into a phenomenal interest rate? I should keep this property. And that, you know, hasn't happened in the past. You know, if you asked me two years ago, hadn't happened for 10 years because everyone was like, well, interest rates are still low. So I still, you you kind of looked at it saying, and it's not that great of a deal. And now people are saying, wow, it was a really great deal that I got locked into these interest rates that were um, artificially low for so long. Yeah. And again, we we have been here before, right? We have that 54-year spreadsheet, which people can get. You can see interest rates in the late 70s. They obviously spike in the low 80s. Transactions crash. And oh, by the way, there were lots of accidental landlords in the early and mid 80s. We are repeating that cycle. The challenge is, is a lot of these landlords, these accidental landlords are frankly not going to know what they what to do. They're not going to know how to advertise. They're not going to know how to communicate. They're not going to know audit trail. Being a landlord, if you don't know what you're doing, is hard. Yeah. I would argue it's hard even if you know what you're doing. So I think one of the things because of the mobile devices, because we are ha uh, having purpose-built apps for landlords, that Hemlane's going to really smooth that transition. So I'd love you to define when you kind of break it down, what are the, what are the things that Hemlane can provide that accidental landlord? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and before I jump into what we can provide, one of the things that I want to bring up with landlording that I hear so often is uh, people almost dream or kind of have this like um, fantasy that everything will be okay when they um, start uh, renting out their property. And so if you're not in it every day, like us to say, how do you mitigate risk? You probably don't see anything that's gone wrong because you as a renter, you paid your rent every day on time and then you moved up and purchased a home. And it's not until you have that renter in the property or you're going through the process that you suddenly realize and something clicks of, oh gosh, this is emotional to some extent you're dealing with people. Um, how do I reduce the emotion? Because there's ways to do that. Hemling uh, can help with that. Um, but there's this, if anyone here is listening and is an accidental landlord and, and hasn't gone through it for a long enough period of time, it's only a matter of time before you realize, hey, property management, while it might seem kind of mundane and easy in a checklist process, mm -hmm. there is a lot of risk mitigation and how you say things. 
um, how you respond to tenants and how upfront you set expectations is going to make it where you don't have any emotion. And it's a much easier, more passive way to, um, uh, to, to build up your, your real estate, um, real estate as um, one of your assets. And so I, I, one, one sec, I'm so glad you brought yeah. that up because I think one of the things an accidental landlord is going to have to get over and get over quickly is this, this thing, this building, this house, this, you know, con, you know, this physical space may have been your primary residence for years. It is no longer your primary residence. Someone else, some other family is living there. And I guarantee you, they won't treat it the same way. Yes. So what you think is a cute remodeled second bath or, you know, the, the plants in the backyard or whatever is just near and dear to you, I guarantee you, and you're going to have to get over it. They will not care as much as you. So I think that's very valid. Yeah. And, and that's actually brings me to my first point of rent estimates. And like, when you get started, we have a free rent estimate tool. So you can go on there and see all the properties in your area. What were they rented for? Um, you know, bedrooms, um, bathroom, square footage, all of that tenants weigh themselves lean more towards how many bedrooms does it have, um, as like their primary factor and how much does it cost? But the reason that is so important is every landlord, including myself, especially with like of my primary residence, thinks it's worth more than it actually <laughs> is. And here is why you have done certain things to that property that have made you motion emotionally attached because you Correct. lived in it. So I might, you know, in my backyard have um, vegetables, right? And say, this is, wouldn't someone want to live here? The neighbor's place yeah. doesn't have a vegetable garden. But uh, tenants are not going to value that. Maybe that's some quirky thing that you That could value. be a negative, frankly. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's more work for them to, to maintain that. And so there's certain things that you have to think about. It's such a good investment, especially if you're locked into that interest rate. You can cash flow it right away. But there's certain things you just have to let go of. You have to let go of, to Michael's point, that the tenants are not going to treat it the same way that you did. There are certain decisions you might make of um, what you rip out in the place or what you say, hey, this will be damaged more so than when I lived here, um, that's going to go into it. And then the uh, kind of worst I've, I've seen is when someone says, oh, but this furniture, this piece of furniture fits exactly here. So I'm not going to bring it to my old house. I hear this all the time from accidental landlords. Yeah, this furniture too. fits. So I'm going to keep this here. And, you know, the tenants are really going to value it. No, it's going to get destroyed. I always say if there's any furniture that you don't want thrown away, don't put it in your rental. Yeah. And it's almost an inconvenience to the tenant because they're like, we have our own stuff. Now we've got something taking up space here that might not be their design, like their yeah. own, um, how they want to design the place. And so it's just really important to take a step back and say, what can this actually rent for? This is now an investment. It is not my primary residence. So it's not something that I should be emotionally attached to how um, well they maintain it. I'm going to be very objective with it, that it should be in the same condition upon move-in with the exception of normal wear and tear, but they're not going to be sitting there repainting every little you mm -hmm. know, nook and cranny when there's a scratch or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot in that. The other thing that I would tell an accidental landlord is if you've, if you've added color your walls or accent walls that you just are dreamy about it's your favorite color it's your wedding color whatever uh you might want to go neutral you might yeah. want to go more neutral and and uh again just realize this is uh it's not yours anymore well it's yours but it's not yours if you know what i mean so another family is going to be there so yeah there's a lot of just this separation it's it's gone from your home to a rental asset and and you really do have to look at it differently yeah. And use the same color throughout the house yep. because it simple. makes it so much easier for your painter to say like, wait, it, which off-white color was this room yeah. versus this room? And that way when Amen. you repaint one wall, you just, your garage has literally that. Every quality. house I have is the same. <laughs> every single one is the same interior color, same exterior. It's, I'm that boring. Yeah. So you're so right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So, so again, you're changing emotions. You're helping them understand rents. Uh, you're getting, you're kind of decluttering, you know, you're not leaving furniture there. The, the next thing I think about him lane uh, that would really help the kind of accidental landlords is advertising. Yeah. Because again, that new landlord is like, 
they may know they may google you know where to advertise a rental unit or whatnot but him lane really has kind of simplified that for, for everyone let alone accidental landlords yeah. So we'll advertise. It's interesting because as, as a landlord, every landlord, I always, it's always based on how old they are, that they have a certain, because of when they rented, ah, of whatever website they used when they rented is always the one I hear about. And so it starts with like Craigslist. Oh, well, Craigslist is the place where all the tenants are looking. And, and then the next like wave of the next generation is like, oh, it's, you know, pad mapper and hot pads. That's where everyone's renting. Every those used of those. To be- I'm old. When I was looking for rentals, PadMapper was where everyone went. And so it's really interesting because it's based on your generation that you think this is where you should list your property. We spend every day looking at, hey, we'll syndicate out to all the listing websites. Which ones actually get inquiries? Where are tenants actually hanging out and trying to find a rental? And then we obviously prioritize those of those feeds are real time. How quickly can we get them on there? And what's interesting is the top um, uh, 10 websites, well, it's really actually the first seven and eight, get you 96% of tenant inquiries. Now mm-hmm. we have all the other ones listed there just in case there's one or two leads that come right. from them or that some landlord comes to us and was like, well, why don't you list on PadMapper. It's like, oh, well, we do. But when you look at the actual data, it's um, the top seven that will really get you most of that traction. And so the reason that I bring that up is you don't have to think about that. With a click of the button, we will publish that out and just help you from that perspective with it. Um, And then another important point when you go through the advertising process is we want to make it very professional as if you had a property manager guiding you through it. And let me give you some examples of that. Pets. There is such thing as pet rent. There's such thing as pet deposits. There's some places like Colorado where you have to limit how much you could charge for that. And so as we go through it, it's not our goal to make the decisions for you. Every single landlord should be empowered to make the decisions themselves. However, we give you the tools and resources to let you know Here is how we look at pet rent and pet deposits, pros and cons of everything, read through it. Here's what averages we see nationwide. However, in your area, you're going to want to look to see what others are charging. And then here are some limitations on the state level um, that you may want to be privy to. And in uh, many states, and I think a lot of states are moving this direction, any fees that you charge need to be in the listing. So you can't like just advertise the rental rate and then the tenant goes to sign the lease and you're like, and I added pet rent and I have added a pet deposit and all these things. And so we're helping make sure all of that is in your listing description. And it's just a much better way to not have a motion get involved or tenants get upset because they didn't know up front what the total cost would be. Um, So that's the first one. The other is um, the AI that we use when we're advertising your property. It's um, it restricts things from a fair housing perspective. So there are certain things that you cannot say. You have to be very objective. You can say there's a school down the street that ranks, you know, um, number seven in the state, right? Like very objective, an elementary school mm-hmm. that's number ranked number seven according to X, Y, and Z. Um, but you can't go in there and say something like it's a great family neighborhood. It's great for kids. Mm-hmm. Something like that is a fair housing violation because you're basically discriminating against those who don't have kids. Mm-hmm. And and so all of that kind of stuff we put in there. And then if you want to ed- be educated more at the right point of like, oh, what is fair housing? There's a little link yeah. and you can click on it and you can read all about your state's fair housing at that moment in time. And so our goal is like not to make the decisions for you, but help mitigate all those risks and teach you as you go through the process. Yeah, I think one of the things that we haven't talked enough about and highlighted with him late is your resources tab, right? If you're going to be an accidental landlord, again, you're, you're not doing this. Like it wasn't your vision or plan. It just yeah. makes financial sense. And your resources tab, just to research that by state level, your little pop-ups or, or windows to get more data, that's just going to be such a way that accidental landlords kind of try to protect themselves and frankly, get educated. So I think that's yeah. right in there. The other one I think about is is an accidental landlord. Well, Hem Lane will help is is potentially with showings, right? Mm-hmm. Again, a lot of accidental landlords will have full time jobs. Again, it wasn't. It's not you know they're not trying to generate 
you know, they're not trying to get passive income to, to stay home, if you will, but it is, it's an asset to help the family. So helping with showings is, is something, and also just having potentially a resource to help with repairs and that repair coordination. There's just so many things that an accidental landlord hasn't thought about, hasn't experienced that him lane helps kind of day one. Yeah. And some examples of that, like on the repair coordination side, these are every time that we had heard, and this was like way in the early days, one from our own experience in property management, but two also in building Hemling in the very early days, Michael, right when I met you was any time there was like a question or something on Hemling, it's like, how do we mitigate that sort of escalation? And, and some examples of that are, um, with no show fees. So typically if a tenant is, if it's tenant occupied, we will have the service professional. So the plumber, the electrician meet with the tenant on site. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is um, traditionally what would happen is, you know, let's just say you say my sink doesn't have hot water. And then the property manager goes out and goes and meets the plumber out there. And then they're like, no, it looks pretty fine to us and you're paying that service call fee charged back. So we want the person who's actually reported the issue exactly. to be the one to explain, oh no, let me explain. It's only between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. that this happens yeah. or whatever it is, whatever quirky thing that they're realizing as the pattern. But with that um, comes, if the tenant is not there, you still have to pay a service call fee. Oh yeah. Because all these vendors, unless it's a large job, they'll then estimate, they'll do uh, bids on it and uh, mm -hmm. an estimate for you. And usually it's free estimates. Sure. Um, but otherwise, if it's a small job, it's usually going to be under $300 is typically how some, it depends on where you live, but what they say is a smaller job. Typically what's going to happen is it's not going to be a, a free estimate. They're going to say there's service call and it's either, either applied towards the work being done or um, it's a service call plus we'll give you the quote of, of what it costs. And with that, there have been situations where tenants will um, go through and um, or it's say, yep, I'll schedule it at 1 p.m. on Thursday and then they're not there. So as part of our process, we say there will be a service call. If you are not there, that cancellation fee will be charged back. All these different things that make it where everyone is aligned and on the same train, moving the same direction yeah. um, to just make sure it's a better experience. So there's plenty of those. Those are like a couple of very detailed examples. But what we try to do is mitigate risk. And so it makes it a very smooth and easy and delightful process for you and also yeah. do it at an affordable rate. Yeah, the one that the one that you and I, you and I talked about, even, you know, our first conversation, maybe it was our second that. Olivia and I struggled with was the audit trail, right? Mm -hmm. The communication. Now, some of that's been simplified because of smartphones and emails and texts. But as as an accidental landlord, you need to know that in some areas, having a text audit trail is not enough, right? You got to document it in other ways. So uh, you're really helping clean up, clean up communication. And then the audit trail of communication um, is really going to help accidental landlords, I think. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And then the last one that I think is going to help a lot of accidental landlords is something you're rolling out more and more going forward. And that's kind of portfolio review, income statements, mm -hmm. just kind of financial statements uh, around the asset. Because I guarantee you, the accidental landlords have not thought about that at all. Yeah. And once you see the numbers and the data, it helps you start making much more data informed decisions of certain things. Like, for example, if you are starting to see that. Um, there's so many repairs for a property. Then the question is, you can dive deep into that and say, what's going wrong on this property? Traditionally, it didn't have so many repairs. Certain things like that will really help you. And so, uh, yes, being able to access everything in one place is super important to us. Yeah. At the end of the day, folks, I think if you're, you are or might be an accidental landlord, you should take advantage of a 14-day trial. Just get a feel. Because I think I think keeping an asset that produces hundreds, if not a thousand dollars in cash flow, is good for you. Inflation is a feature, not a bug. You've mm -hmm. got a two or three percent interest rate fixed for thirty years. That is your asset. Keep it, and then you could use Hemlane to smooth the process, make it easier, demystify being a landlord. Uh, don't give up on being an accidental landlord just because you think it's hard. There are ways uh, to do it. Hemlane is one of those. Dana, if somebody wanted to get the trial, where do we send them? Yeah, go to www.hemlane, that's H-E-M, 
L-A-N-E.com. But mention one rental at a time because you do get 20% off your uh, first year. So please, please make sure to mention one yeah. rental at a time. Yeah, if you don't mention one rental at a time, you pill, you pay full boat. So who wants to pay the full rate? Exactly. So mention one rental at a time, save some money. Dana, you're amazing. Keep going. Great. Thanks for having me. You got it.